Welcome to day two of the summit on new media art archiving. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be available later on online. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the participants for their incredible work in helping to make history stay alive. And today we have, we're going to be starting with a very interesting set of talks. These are lightning talks. Lightning talks are fast, five minutes, lots of ideas, lots of incredible research and artworks. Um, and so I'm gonna not take any extra time and let's start off with Dario, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Oh, okay. oh, oh it's okay. Ilion, sorry. <laughs> no That's your colleague, actually. Yes, exactly. <laughs> This is your presentation, right? <coughs> Hi, everyone. So um, today I propose to present Uncopied. It can be seen as a NFT minting platform, or it can be seen as an online distributed archive of new media. Um, how did it start? Uh, yesterday, we saw the presentation of work by Dario Evelyn uh, uh, on a representation of COVID-19. Uh, one of the output was also this image, which we called uh, Chinese Sea, which is um, uh, another visual representation of uh, scientific communities uh, involved in COVID from uh, an aspect of uh, cultural diversity. And we wanted to create a limited edition physical edition of this, this picture, but distribute it as creative commons. And so uh, we brainstormed on this idea and in the end, uh, we used the technology from the 13th century called the chirograph. The idea is you take a sheet of paper, you write the same contract three times, then you cut it. Two people go with one copy of the contract and the third party keeps it as proof of the authenticity of the contract. So Uncopied is using a similar technique with five pieces uh, to create a verifiable label that cannot be copied uh, to authenticate a physical object. Now, this was about physical object, but we have the same issue in the digital world. So in the physical world now, it's almost possible to copy any painting, any photography, uh, to a point that it's impossible to tell which is the original and which is the copy. In the digital world, it's the same. A picture is copied identically, and all NFT or blockchain technology does is attribute an ID for it, but you could still create a new ID on another NFT platform. Uh, so it doesn't really provide any absolute unicity, except in the context of one blockchain. So the idea was to address both these aspects. The first one is addressed using the chirograph, and the second one is addressed using a reverse search engine, which recognizes the images as being the same. So in the end, the system has this chirograph for physical object. Then there's a document that explains what is the object, what is its provenance, what is the purpose. Then there's metadata, which can be linked to art or schema.org. The idea is to have long-term conservation on a distributed database system called IPFS, which is similar to that used in the NFTs. One of its principles is it's public, it's replicated, it's sensor-proof, but it raises questions also on how to um, implement legitimate censorship, for example, for child pornography or things like that. Then there's the reverse image search, so that you can recognize that this picture is actually the original picture. And all this uh, is using a carbon-friendly blockchain uh, to, to, to make sure we don't burn the planet when we archive a photography, for example. Um, so this is a chirograph manually made or uh, made on a larger scale using a special printer. The similarity, the idea is common perhaps to uh, Google with a search engine. The idea is to recognize that two pictures are 
the same even if it's really small changes. So what did we start? We start with digital art, very collective artworks, experimenting also with way to provide royalty systems for the artists. Uh, we also experimented with a way to secure um, cultural heritage objects. This is a statuette from Mali in Africa. Uh, the original project was with uh, a pilot project with the National Museum of Mali and with the Museum of Kebrani. And uh, we experimented also with violins, typically unique objects with this secure label in an industry where traditional labels are very copied very often. And finally, this is one of the latest exhibition with uh, LACMA Museum and EPOC. Or this is an example that is a mix of physical and digital artwork with uh, an artist called Nancy Baker Cahill. Now, what are some of the questions left? How to implement uh, legitimate censorship? One question, a uh, second question, which I took yesterday is how to link it so with other archives in a distributed system like this one. And third, it's also what is the right model? We started this as a company. Uh, maybe not for profit would have been a better model for long-term conservation conservation and archiving. So that's also some of the open uh, points at this point. Thank you very much. Slight adjustment to Daria. Do you want to get up and start your slide? Um, slight adjustment to the schedule. Um, First of all, I want to say that all of the presenters should present themselves in an effort to preserve the correct pronunciation of their name, because I'm sure I won't do such a good job. But uh, Daria is going to go next. This number, yeah, she will, yeah, yeah. You want the full screen, yeah, sure. So you can see that. Uh, okay, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for the invitation. Um, my co author, Linnea Zemmerling, unfortunately cannot be here with us today, so I'm going to present alone. My talk is about a participatory video art channel called Be My Play. It can be found on the website of the Dusseldorf Nonprofit Foundation in my Intermedia Art Institute. But who can participate and how? And what kind of video art can be found in EMI's archive? The answer to the first question is easy. EMI Play was made for you. The channel is open to general public and everyone who creates an account, which is free of charge, can participate in it. In my play invites users to create video art playlists, publish them on the foundation's website and share them on social media. Through social tagging, every playlist is accompanied by user-defined metadata to facilitate new readings of our archive. In my play can thus be understood as a tool for user-defined metadata collection that provides new possibilities for citizen science and the humanities. Before I explain how you can participate in EMI Play, let me say a few words about EMI's online archive of video art. It boasts more than 1,000 videos from the 1970s until today. So we have a huge collection. It is even bigger, but I'm just talking about the online archive now. The works include the Western canon of video art, underground music videos, as well as performance documentations. Hey, you can, here you can see how the catalog looks like. Um, it's a screenshot from EMI's website. And in order to find videos, users can search the catalog by filters. You can see them on the left side on the, of the screen. 
um, like for example, artist's name, work title, date, and others. And here I activated filter by year and selected videos um, that were produced in the 1980s, between 1980 and 1990. And the total, maybe you can see it on the top um, right corner of the screen, a total of 453 videos was found, which might give you an idea about the profile of our archive and that a large part of digitized videos is from this decade, from the 80s. And um, yeah, videos can be viewed in full length. And um, in the lower right corner of the screen, um, I hope you can see over there, it's quite small icon. Um, you can see this um, list icon with a plus sign over there. And that leads us back to our topic of We Might Play. By clicking on the list icon, users can add videos to playlists in e My Play. This is a screenshot of the e My Play channel from the foundation's website. The channel is connected, as I already said, to the online archive I have just introduced. And um, as I said before, users can compile um, the videos from the archive into playlists and share them with other users. Um, to do so, they must create a personal account that allows them not just to create playlists, but also to comment on playlists of other users. And the channel is very easy to use and it meets the expectations and habits um, that users have developed from interactions with commercial platforms, um, audiovisual platforms and streaming services. So um, every playlist has to be tagged with at least three user-defined tags. There are no predefined tags. So um, the channel went online last fall and until today, there are more than 180 tags. You can briefly view some examples here just to get a glimpse of the variety of tags. So all user-defined tags. This is what a playlist looks like. And the order of the videos can be set easily using arrow icons on the right. And yeah, users can decide whether to keep the playlist private or to publish it on EMI's website. Programs can be shared on social media too. And users can also create their personal watch lists and comment on playlists of other users. Um, I'm coming to the end. Uh, with EMI Play, the Intermedia Art Institute aims to stimulate communication about video art and create a space for new perspectives on our archive for discoveries and unexpected connections. And since the launch, there are about 60 active users on the channel. We look forward to further contributions and we would love to welcome you on EMI Play. And um, these are our partners and funders, very important to mention. And yeah, I'm looking forward to your question. Um, this is my email address and also a link to my play. Thank you so much for your attention. I want to mention that there will be a discussion with all the presenters after the short lightning talks. Uh, our next presenter will be joining us remotely and he will introduce himself. This is Arno. Hi, good morning. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Arnaud Gifreu. I'm professor at ERAM, University of Girona in Spain. And I will introduce you uh, my, my presentation. Let me, if I can just share my screen for five minutes. Um, do let me know if you are able to, to see my screen. Yep. So uh, my, my contribution to the, to the summit is entitled Collecting and Preserving Expanded and Extended Nonfiction. Um, what I'm trying to do in the last years basically is defining a specific area, which is nonfiction, um, which since the beginning of the literary genres, it's this, this territory called nonfiction 
uh, has represented a way of knowing and learning about us and the world that's around us. And I particularly think that reality well told always surpasses fiction. So I am uh, enclosed in a place between um, reality, nonfiction, and art. And basically, I, I do believe that at this moment, um, we are experiencing a critical moment in the 21st century in which what is happening around us is very important. So basically, for me, it's very important to map, to, to establish a first map of reality. And to do that, I'm planning to, to develop, to design a set of, or kit of production guidelines and models for nonfiction narratives, which will be designed and developed to help producers, companies, researchers, and lecturers. In that order, I want to map the territory of the audiovisual, interactive, transmedia, and immersive nonfiction narratives in order to analyze the intersections and combinations between different nonfiction genres, to study the reception and impact of these works, to promote and stimulate the preservation and of nonfiction productions, and to provide design elements and project development for the benefit of the companies in the sector. These would be the, the objectives, but basically, here, my idea is to, to conduct a research and to create a web platform which will be structured as a database. This platform will contain uh, 50 examples, 50 case studies of production in which I have been involved in the last 15 years in several fields, but specifically on nonfiction and art projects. And basically, um, in order to, act, to, do, to give access to the users, I will establish a delimitation of a set of filters in terms, for example, of time, period, topic, author, um, area, nonfiction area, and that, that filters will allow users to generate templates. Each template will be adapted to their needs. And for example, a user can look for a specific template in terms of academic production, or in terms of professional production, or in terms of festival or art production. So it will be designed following these guidelines. Um, today, this project is currently in an advanced stage of development. Um, and basically, I have been researching on interactive documentary and art documentary in the last 15 years. So I take some elements from this first research and I jump into this new research of nonfiction, um, which is uh, in the, the, the area in which I'm involved today. So wrapping up, summing up, all these variables, what I expecting, I'm expecting to do in the, I think that the next year I will defend a doctoral thesis or a doctoral research work, which will be composed um, by a doctoral thesis and a book and research article, this analysis of 50 projects, an online course uh, regarding nonfiction, which I'm designing, which will be, which will consist of 10 levels a workshop, a development workshop, which will include the analysis of 10 projects, applied projects for companies regarding branding no, and giving companies uh, freedom to design and develop nonfiction narrative, and uh, the web platform I was telling before, which will contain 50 projects, filters, and guidelines. Um, this is a huge project. This is a huge, um, a huge initi initiative which I'm doing alone, but I'm expecting to uh, team up with other uh, companies, other producers, other ac academies, which will could help me in that specific way. So I'm open to, to, to discussion, to contribution, and to share with the other panelists and the public and audience attending this uh, fantastic uh, symposium to expand ideas and to talk about possible contributions and future possibilities. Thank you very much. Our next presenter will be Teresa, and she'll be joining us for Malta. So I think now can you hear me? Uh, hi, thanks for having me. I will start to present now. 
my name is Teresa Havrikova. I am a member of Center for Netscon, Center for Net Art, a small young initiative um, reconstructing, maintaining, and preserving net art and net culture in Berlin. And through our activities, we research the possibilities of uh, contextualization of net art and digital art. And today I would like to show you our small online archive that we uh, created last year for our project Algorithm Control Net Art and Cybernetics. Since 2019, um, our group has been a pioneer user in House of Statistics in Berlin, an urban project trying to rejuvenate an old um, abandoned building in the center of uh, the city. Um, the location and the history of House of Statistics was a departure for the exhibition and research project Calculate and Control Net Art and Cybernetics. So working from the history of um, the House of Statistics, which is um, which um, used to operate as the central administrative headquarter for statistics of the German Democratic Republic, so um, East Germany, we explored the impact of cybernetics and the techno utopia of the time on the artist artistic and social practices, and we traced the narrative kind of to the contemporary practices of data collecting and processing. Um, as part of the project, we designed a small online archive, as you can see here. It includes resources um, and references related to topics such as um, GDR, data processing, as well as artworks, and especially, and especially net art. Um, the references can be books, uh, websites, artworks, videos, or lectures. Um, the archive really depicts a very specific and subjective um, cluster of interconnected topics that can be filtered through these uh, created uh, texts. Some are more specific, like House of Statistics um, or data processing, and some are more abstract, like Magic or Utopia. The archive was built used, um, by, by using or misusing the open source software for bibliography Sotero. Uh, which is primarily deployed in academic uh, communities. The research assistant program works as the input mask for the entries, as well as a control panel for the archive. So by adding specific tags and related entries, the structure of the archive can be directly shaped here in Zotero. Um, but the Zotero software does not only determine the entries and the structure of the archive, but also controls the whole website. So by adding specific texts, such as um, hashtag unconference on hashtag exhibition, uh, the website displays information about the events that took place. Um, so in this way, the archive is very much intertwined with the project and, uh, and it also additionally creates space for the documentation of the project itself. Um, the particularities and including its dysfunctionalities of Zotero database imprint themselves into the website architecture, um, making the structure of the hidden database kind of visible, uh, for example, through the cryptic entry codes or uh, text or automatically grab technical details about the publications. So strictly speaking, Calculating Control Archive does not archive the source material, the books or the artworks related to the project. Rather, it works as a collection of references that can be connected in many different ways. And I like to call this archive a research-based archive. The structure of this research-based archive allows making new links between net art and other historical artifacts and references. Here is an example of an entry uh, by the artist group Mondrail and their work um, Natural Heritage and Natural Selection. And as you can see here, both in Zotero and online, here are all sorts of different texts and entries related or assigned to that artwork. The archive is, present, uh, is preserving the process of the research as well as some parts of the projects, stretching the definition of archive to its limits. Even though it might seem that such an archive doesn't fulfill really its function as an agency for long-term preservation of net art, I would argue that it's not an empty archive. Rather than being focused on one singular medium or an art period, this research-based archive introduces one possible narrative in which specific net artworks can be entered. So it connects net art to local history as well as a discourse outside of art historian field. Because of the nature of net art and especially early net art that is spread on the internet, often located on a unique uh, domain, the usual tools for centralized archive might not be available. Um, so for net art, one possible way to establish a canon is by continuous reconnection to different narratives and contexts, and especially online. Um, projects like Calculate and Control Archive um, support the circulation of net art 
and um, the collective in the collective online memory connecting it to different narratives and discourses and stabilizing its position in this emerging action. I think I can hear the sound now. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's it. That was my presentation. Thank you. Our next presenter will be Violetta, and her colleague will join us during the uh, conversation afterwards, and, and that's Edward. It's this one, right? Yes, yes. So, hello, I'm Violetta. <clears throat> I'm going to present to you Memory Post Human Archive. It's an archive made by an artist about the artist of uh, Generation X. Uh, it's an archive focused on the digital humanities and the cyber, cyber anthropology. Its main focus is uh, the site specific media art history. So, archiving media art from the underrepresented regions, documentation of new media artworks that became inaccessible due to the instability of the internet media and the rapid absence of the computer technology, and most of all, modeling the new methodology, which is uh, site specifically uh, sensitive. Uh, so the idea builds on the concept of memics, question how technology can help to capture marginalized creation and innovation. Its goal is to establish future, uh, uh, enable future researchers to study evolution of the environmental complexity, identity of an artist, and the genesis of the site-specific media art phenomena. Specifically, the way artists employ tools, develop in iconography, form their professional identity, and how the emergence of personal epistemology of the, uh, of the artists happens. First project was Novi Sad Digi Povera. Novi Sad is a city in the north of Serbia. Uh, specific uh, for the, I was concentrated on a, a um, digital migration of Generation X. Uh, specifically for that uh, environment is that a scene develops in a condition of the scarce resources of both fundamental and virtual economy. This is the, uh, like, timetable of uh, new media uh, examples in Vojvodina, like information-based art uh, from the 57 up to the World Wide Web when the Generation X uh, comes. Uh, the scene due to the war which happens in Yugoslavia, the scene was very dispersive. So if I wanted to uh, study it, I have to find the pattern that connects. Uh, so I formed the neologism, which is called Digipovera, and it signifies Hi-fi concepts in low-fi production, a digital artwork created in a poor conditions from poor materials, cracked software programs, cheap and used computers. Specifically for Generation X is that topics that were dominated were control, info war, cyber ecosystem, and constructions of the future. Those are the topics that this very small uh, database can link to the big hubs that we have uh, and that we saw during this presentation. I was focusing on the Generation X, as you can see, uh, but uh, yesterday we also have uh, like uh, two presenters from Novisat. One was Predrick Shijanin, he's a representative of the baby boom generation, and Andrea Palashki, she's a millennials. Uh, so specific uh, feature of my database would be that artwork as a case study would have like a, a feature of conjecture, and it means the state of the social system. Context, it means outer basis of art, of science, economy, or et cetera, within the social system. Then the redundant one, concept, iconography, and technical description. And special focus is socio-biography of the artist, because artist is treated as a witness of a paradigm change, so technological, environmental, and social transformation. 
this is the example of uh, conjecture of internet. Uh, the best ideas, uh, the major, uh, uh, the major innovations, and uh, technology that enable the internet to grow. So those were the protocols that were accepted by everybody and that enable uh, the spread of the network. And my last question is how to write European history of technical media and environment art in the conjuncture of New Europe, 1988-2022. So this is the moment when my little database might uh, contribute to the knowledge with very site specific knowledge to the bigger picture, especially if we have in mind uh, that all big databases come from the festivals. They are uh, the archives of the festivals. And since the late 90s and 2000, there, is, uh, there has been, it's called like a civilization of culture. So the cultural policy have huge impact on the, uh, databases and in general. And my focus would be uh, economy of attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> And there is a leaflet. I can take it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last presenter in this series is uh, Jai. Go ahead and get set up. Which one you put in? Is it PowerPoint or PowerPoint? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jai Young and I'm an Associate Professor of Design from the University of California, Davis in USA. Uh, my gratitude to Bonnie and Terry and team for providing me with this platform. Uh, the purpose of my being here today is to prompt the question of how cultural institutions can champion the archiving of new media art scenario where a substantial Twitter database and its associated uh, visualizations as a byproduct of the artwork where once upon a time tracked social media activities in real time is a significant component. In 2022, um, in, in 2020, I created an artwork on the status of truth telling um, crisis during the 2020 US presidential election. The project is titled Project Echo Thoughts in Fleeting Moments. It's a multimodality and multidisciplinary new media artwork involving Twitter data and took two and a half years of extensive research collaboration with a political scientist and a computer engineer to develop. When the project concluded shortly after the Capitol insurrection, we realized that we had a compiled a significant database of tweets. It has become a valuable historical record of Twitter disinformation activity relating to the 2020 US presidential election. The new media artwork functioning as an apparatus, providing legibility into the black box of an astroturfy efforts of Twitter, at the same time enacting a platform for voices of protest and expression of lived experiences in a post-truth um, post society. The project took place <clears throat> in a critical eight months period preceding the 2020 election. It consisted of two components that worked in tandem an online disinformation tracking and visualization interface and a temporary public art social intervention that took to billboards, bus shelters, and grocery stores in critical swing states. Shown here is a photo from a live webcam on the digital billboard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on Interstate 95 with traffic heading towards Bucks County communities, one of the key swing counties um, during the election. Specifically developed um, for the project, the team created a process to um, curate this information, combine the query of historical and real-time Twitter data, set up a back-end database, and materialize the real-time front-end visualization of this information spread. Each disinformation topic includes three sets of charts, a seismograph that monitors live Twitter activities on the topic, a set of uh, influencer bar charts that show the time top influencers appear and the likelihood an influencer is a Twitter bot. 
and an animated social diagram, which maps out user interfaces, um, interactions, including those who are spreading disinformation and those who are trying to debunk it. Live data is downloaded to the database every 15 minutes, which is in turn refreshes the visualization on screen every 15 minutes. Here's an example of a seismograph, an example of an influencer identification, and an influencer of a high chance bot operation, and an example of a social diagram. All in all, the database consists of 204 disinformation topics from April 28, 2020 to February 20th, 2021, over 2.6 million tweets, 1 million users, and 2.3 million incidences of user interactions. There are over 100,000 accounts found displaying a high probability of being fully automated social bots carrying out astroturfing efforts designed to deceive and create the appearance of a grassroots movement. 90% of database um, retained full um, original data fidelity of the Twitter landscape at the time. We captured these tweets before Twitter performed a mass deletion of major disinformation spreaders in January 2021 after the Capitol insurrection. The record contains the now deleted at real Donald Trump and 70,000 QAnon accounts. In conclusion, I'd like to bring it to your attention that the project concluded in February 2021 with a significant data set of historical importance. The question at hand are how to transform the apparatus and its associated Twitter data repository into an archive and provide public access to the data set to enable future research. The work is beyond the means of an individual artist on a financial and technical front to upkeep the work for a long time. Then what does it take to set up an infrastructure support at the cultural and educational institutional level, particularly those with a history of rigid um, such discourse between artistic expression, technology, and public engagement. I look to an institution such as Isaiah to prompt this crucial dialogue about how to archive once upon a time real-time social media activity visualizations while providing ongoing public access to the historical artifacts, particularly given the significance of the data set in American history. I look forward to conversing with everybody in the audience my collaborators, my grant supporters. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. What a diversity of topics. So we have a lot of people joining us remotely. So we're going to ask the remote uh, attendees and participants to add information into the questions and answer period. Uh, part of Zoom. And so I'd like to just start it off with asking, actually, if we could get all the presenters to come up. So up here, could we have, could you grab us a couple more chairs? Now we do need to talk into the microphone. So I'm going to pass around some microphones. Actually, I'll just. While we're waiting for some uh, questions to come in, I'll ask you, what were some of your biggest challenges? And I'd like you to comment on some unexpected um, successes, things that came out of your archiving or your work that were kind of surprising and you thought, wow, this is awesome. Okay. But what were your challenges as well? Okay, go ahead and turn the microphone on, make sure it's on. No, it's on. It's on. It's on. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll just really uh, quickly comment. I think um, over the course of two and a half years, as we did this Twitter work, uh, every moment is a surprise. Nearly every month, something new happens on social media. 
um, and prompt us to, to think about the world differently, prompt us to um, um, guide, uh, direct the project a little bit differently. And of course, the January um, our capital introduction is yet another surprise. Um, and then what to do about that, and then what to do with our archive um, that really prompted in the end our um, you know, decision to, to want to release this to the public. Hey, um, in the project in my play, um, the challenge was to connect our online archive with a solution for the in my play platform, and it is a custom built solution. So that was the um, kind of challenge, but we uh, managed it. And um, yeah, it's it's wonderful to have a chance to present the project here because, as I said, we have around about 60 active users on the channel and we would like to promote it and to invite people to uh, join us on my play in order also to have more user-defined metadata and in order to continue our research on that topic. Uh, for me, there was a uh, one personal discovery that uh, since I was part of the scene, I realized while, while I was doing research uh, that I have usually participated, if in Serbia, only at international exhibitions or international places, because I usually uh, did works internationally. Uh, for example, uh, the people you just saw from Arisaki never exhibited together, we were never even together. So this is the first time that we got together virtually and Norisaki is a tiny city, it's 300 people. So thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, so the project is pretty young. So uh, so we've uh, so far had uh, some success applying to very different use cases like physical object certification and protection or digital object uh, um, certification and archiving. Um, but the main challenge is still around moderation, curation, and what is the right governance to decide what you should take an out of the take out of an archive? Um, and we're considering using what the blockchain calls DAO, which is basically a voting system based on uh, some of the uh, users, uh, but it doesn't seem perfect either. Uh, so this is still a challenge for us, and uh, and uh, we'd be happy to. And I know there will be some conversations today around that, so I'm looking forward to that. We have a question. We have a question from the chat. And also, I'm going to pose a challenge to you. I would like you to think of questions for the uh, uh, participants up here. OK, so we'll be passing the mic off to you. But um, oh, our question disappeared. Okay. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> Regarding I, IMA. I play. Would it be interesting from your side to provide a tool or editor for users to remix content? Example to create new videos, mashups, etc. Did you consider this option at some point, even though it is complex effort? Yeah, I had the same question actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please go ahead and talk it into. Uh, it's a very interesting question, but of course. Um, oh. It is all the question of copyright. It's an artistic material and it's online because we have distribution agreements with the artists who provided their videos. And uh, so we can show them online, but of course uh, we cannot offer this material for other users like YouTube <laughs> does. And even YouTube cannot do it. So it's really, there are artworks and um, the idea is to um, have a platform um, for communication about video art, uh, to have a platform where people who um, yeah, don't know about video art maybe discover works and learn about it. So uh, this creative aspect is very interesting, but um, at the moment at least, I don't think that we can realize it. <laughs> 
it's almost an invitation to you all to join the roundtable discussion this afternoon on ethics. What is permissible within archiving? Mm -hmm. Questions from the audience? Nobody was up for the challenge this morning. Come well, on. We have a question over here. Yes? Mm -hmm. Question? <laughs> A quick question about the online material since you're dealing with online material and open to the public. So, how to deal with the censorship? Uh, I mean, some material actually for like YouTube or Facebook, they yeah, that, that's a big concern for them. So, when you build a platform, so what's the consideration and or obstacles you, you have been encountered? Um, well, as I already said, there are no, I mean, is it a question for me? Oh, no, no, in general. In general? Yeah. Okay, then I'll just uh, start quickly. Um, as I already said, there are no predefined tags. The users can, um, uh, yeah, um, tag uh, videos. And uh, before we publish the list with tags and the show description and uh, before comments can appear, of course, the, of course there's a kind of um, editorial um, like, um, yeah, check of that. But that's all. I mean, we don't, um, there are no predefined tags. Maybe with social media uh, data, Censorship, uh, first day of censorship always happens at the uh, uh, level of, for example, my project at the cafeteria level. You have uh, uh, no, no, no idea as to what was even happening in terms of their algorithms that was filtered out. And as far as my project goes, um, in so far, uh, visualizations and everything, we, we don't filter. Um, in terms of uh, what, what we think is uh, valid as long as it, it's it consistent with the topic that we were looking for. Uh, however, as we um, uh, look into uh, public release, I'm sure a lot more censorship questions will come, uh, come up as well as copyright. Uh, in the term for my project, uh, since I'm working on a case study and doing interviews with artists and so on, so uh, it's a different kind of project and it's a, it is very small, so it's, it's treated as an art piece itself. So it does not have that type of people just, if they don't want it, they will just ignore it. <laughs> Yes, so to, to share one bit of design that we've uh, uh, already confirmed on this matter of censorship. So the promise of Uncopied is when you put objects, it stays there forever. With the warranty of the blockchain on IPFS replication. Um, but on the other hand, we want to make it possible to censor, for example, child pornography or copyright infringement. So the way we plan to do it is to take out to give a, a kind of a maybe 10 day period for people to vote or to decide then to take out the um, material like in high definition image replace it with a pixelized version but the original image would be encrypted using a random key and the idea is to do a little bit like uh, what the vatican is doing for forbidden books or what the French National Library does, you know, with this inferno. You put something in the, in the inferno, it means it will be possible again, maybe in 50 years or 100 years, to decrypt this data again and to reconsider censorship. But at least for the next 50, 100 years, this data is not readable. So that's the design we have right now. Uh, what's left is how we decide and who decides. Uh, I would like something to add uh, in uh, terms of uh, social biography of artists. Uh, if, for example, society is uh, uh, censored itself, then biography of artists is bringing uh, already censored ma material from the past. So it's a reverse project process. And you're my presenters. <laughs> We'd, ask, we'd like to ask these questions of our online participants. So, Teresa, do you want to tackle one of these questions? 
Oh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of respond to the question from the audience, because I think it's a very, very important question uh, about how to deal with um, internet material or online material, not just um, in regards of the censorship, but also the way we kind of assume that internet is a very homogeneous um, space, you know, kind of uh, unique for the for, for all participants. So um, coming from kind of the perspective of net art, you always kind of assume that something will not work rather than it will work. So in many ways, it is kind of similar to, to maybe even like performance art practice. You are trying to describe something that will be broken very soon and it's already broken because people have different devices, they have different uh, browsers. So even if you design archive that works perfectly in, in one browser, that doesn't mean that it will work on, uh, on another completely different brand of a smartphone. Um, so I think all these, all these things are constantly changing and really challenging uh, the idea of a everlasting archive that can be, that can be online and censorship and uh, different accessibility to, to platforms and internet um, uh, internet applications is definitely an important and very challenging part of that. Arno, do you want to comment on any of these questions? Well, I would like to add that in my specific case regarding the, the question, the first question that you asked to the people that the, my colleagues that are there physically. In my case, in terms of nonfiction, the problem I had is that I was uh, researching on 50 projects that were made by Flash, Director, and other technologies, which in the end, they are not working today. So in the end, my, my efforts in that way was to capture, for example, capture online captures or doing some videos uh, in, in, in the terms of saving this, this material and uploading to my, my current research. So it was like a possibility in terms of creating this kind of digital archive in regarding technologies that today are not available, like I repeat HTML in old versions or Flash or Director and old uh, software that are not working um, anymore. So my problem was in trying to rescue these projects that were made, uh, let's say 15, 20 years ago and trying to show to the, to the audience, to the interesting, interesting, interested people in, in producing nonfiction and art uh, artifacts today. So this was my, my, my main challenge and the, the way I found interesting in terms of saving the material at that point was to, to make recordings and to make pieces of videos that were available and will be available on, the, on my online platform in terms of nonfiction. Thank you. We have one last question and we're going to take a very short break for coffee. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid uh, my question is quite long, but I will try to put a uh, sharp. And uh, my question will be, uh, you are all, uh, so thank you for the presentations. Uh, uh, you are all more or less uh, projects in development, so you are kind of creating something new. And my question will be, how do you deal with dependencies? Dependencies in the sense of, of an infrastructure, a server, or uh, more servers, or everything. Uh, even from software perspective, so you rely on kind of a uh, software doing things. Uh, for example, uh, Teresa was um, using uh, Zotero's interface, which Zotero is kind of a project you can somehow trust. There are some institutions behind it and everything. It's uh, a free software, so you can count on it and you can also uh, have a company that do that for you. And my question would be how did you uh, deal with it or how are you dealing with it and what are the main thoughts you, uh, you have? My question will be to talk longer about it, but right now it's just a uh, fast thought about uh, this. Okay, very quickly. Uh, well, our website is Drupal based, so um, that's the answer to the question. <laughs> And uh, the software solution was custom built, and of course, we hope that it will be um, there in the future. These dependencies with the structure of the websites are there. Of course, we have to deal with these um, issues, and um, yeah. Um, in my case, very much, uh, I'm looking at um, uh, working with libraries um, uh, to see about archiving and uh, upkeep. Um, the database and provide um, a public um, access, which is going to be uh, ongoing, you know, forever, because technology is forever going to um, upgrade. Um, and
and I'm an artist, so I'm, I'm looking to pass this on to an entity who can upkeep. Um, the dependency, dependency question is very important. I mean, I think you guys are just going to have to keep, keep, on, keep on upgrading. There's no way around it. Okay, since our project is quite small in the sense of data, uh, artist data, uh, we made custom made design for each research and then uh, put it deep within the system, within the society and so on. So it's more like a prototyping. And if we find some interesting uh, overlapping or something like that, then it can be in the future implemented for uh, big data or something like that. But it's more like a prototyping and custom made uh, representation. Yes, thank you. So I try and answer your question and also uh, Yanni Polito's question about uh, how uh, we duplicate NFT using reverse image search. Uh, so as a private company, we made the choice to use and to rely on open source software. Um, and at the same time to do everything we do released as open source. So for this example, um, we reuse existing algorithm for reverse search. Uh, so it doesn't need, for example, tagging of uh, the image or adding a barcode. It's really based on image recognition. But we also wanted this feature to be very ecological. So um, to be able to search about 100 million image in 100 milliseconds. Uh, so we reuse um, open source database on one side and uh, image recognition algorithms like best Hash on the other. Um, and that's how we uh, try to reduce dependencies as much as possible. Okay, a couple last comments from Arno and Teresa. Any responses? Um, yeah, um, I already mentioned that Sotera was built on, uh, that the archive was built on Sotera. Um, we, our website, which is where the archive is accessible, is hosted by um, a German German agency, and we have a server that um, we are very lucky to to work with some artists that uh, run their own server. So it is all hosted um, on an independent server, uh, which is uh, very nice, but sometimes also very difficult because um, since they are involved in hacking activities, it is very secure. So sometimes we cannot really access our own server. So um, sometimes it's back and forth and kind of trying to find uh, a middle ground between how far you can go with, uh, with security and with uh, running your own infrastructure and then actually um, accessibility and usability. Arno, any comments? No, it's okay. It's fine by me. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. We're going to take Let's give them a round of applause. Walk, stretch, grab a croissant, and come on back. Uh, I forgot to mention if you would like to know more about our foundation, I brought the handbook. So please take a look how that's the Our next presentation is a panel from Hong Kong, and we will have them introduce themselves. Hello. Uh, Hello, you guys we can here? hear yeah. you. We're yeah. ready. All right. All right. Okay, um, so uh, welcome everyone uh, for joining in our, our session today. Um, our session title is entitled uh, Emerging Collaborative Preservation Project in Asia. And I'm John Chow, this is Mara Chen. 
Uh, we are both from Video Touch uh, in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, thank you everyone again for joining in the, the sessions. Um, right, so similar to many cultural institutions who also collect media artifacts, uh, Video Touch have an, uh, had an early encounters with the challenge of uh, preserving artwork with its full authenticities uh, in a soon or already obsolete media format. So in our case, uh, it was magnetic tapes such as uh, features, TV tapes, uh, video aid, uh, et cetera, uh, which uh, we found no matter how perfect the storage conditions are, uh, will eventually deteriorate in approximately the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, also about the machine and the equipment, such as a VCR and DVD player, uh, all of these related equipments are in the obsolete model already, which will only be more and more difficult for the maintenance uh, and repairing attempt due to deterioration and without new production of repairing parts. Uh, we reckon most form of uh, media artworks are also facing the same immense challenge of uh, the pr preservation, which uh, already has attracted uh, many focused research and policy of their attention within the art field for the past decades. For this, we want to ask, um, are there any alternative perspectives we could adopt that apart from fixating on maintaining the condition of media object that could be handled with constant effort by archival professional and museum workers? How do we fellow art practitioners such as curators, researcher, educators, or even artists themselves could contribute to assist institutional documentation of the media art history? Mm, so by this question, uh, this panel brings together three esteemed art professionals across different fields who have collaborated with us video touch uh, before to share their experience from their past curated preservation project in the Asia Pacific regions. First of all, we have Kao Jung, is a Hong Kong based curator and researcher whose recent exhibition explored the dynamic between technologies, materiality, and human agency. He's also the curator at Video Touch and the lecturer at School of Creative Media Hong Kong. He will be sharing the Lift Your Body <coughs> virtual residency project on the Minecraft platform, which will cover topics in digital materiality and also online collaboration. Uh, next up is Zhou Kuang is an international media art curator, writer, producer, and also an educator based in Hong Kong. Um, she's currently the program director for Microwave International New Media Arts Festival, and she will talk about her selected media art project and the challenges during the pandemic time. Lastly, we have Su Wai, is currently the researcher at the Tsinghua University Art Museum in China. He's an art writer, historian, and curator based in Beijing. As one of the curator of Radio Touch uh, Greater China Collection, he will be sharing the experience of our collaborative preservation outreach in between Hong Kong and mainland China. So without further ado, we'll now pass on the time to the presenters. Uh, let's welcome Joe. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen first. Is it okay? Yes. Okay, cool. Well, thank you for the introductions. And today we have quite limited time. So I'll just do a very short introductions about my projects. As mentioned by Video Task uh, team, that I'm a curator, writer, researcher, and educator focused on uh, media arts. And then that's why I write, I research, I curate, I produce a lot. And then um, I've done like uh, during the pandemic, you know, these two to three years. I've produced and curated many different projects. Uh, lots of them are actually online. Some are not yet launched now. Like this one is actually postponed due to COVID, which is actually an online project, but together with uh, offline events and exhibition as well, which is going to be launched in Sanjia later, TBC at the moment, featuring Hong Kong media art and uh, of course, microwave edition and some media art performances and museum commissions. Well, today uh, our focus will be on one of my key projects now, last year called uh, Connecting the Dots. Um, it's an online project which uh, divided into two parts. First part is um, about a web scene, web magazine, and the second part is an online exhibitions. Why this, is, this would be a key project that I would like to, you know, 
uh, share today because um, during pandemic, there are some open calls for online project, which we don't have to get offline. Um, but at the same time, actually, I, I teach a lot at the same time. I realize that every time when I teach, uh, no matter it's um, about curatorship or project management, uh, arts, I mean, related to film and media, um, I have to uh, do the, uh, I have to organize the teaching material every time. Uh, based on Hong Kong media arts development. There's not much you know, information uh, or books or publication or shows that I can, I can, I can adopt. Um, and I've been working for microwave for 16 years already. And then from the start when I working for microwave as a project manager and later to be the curator, uh, my board member always remind me to do good archive of every single shows and then all the publications and, and shows. And then eventually I realized that maybe it's time for us to do something to archive the development of Hong Kong media arts. And then that's why I got an idea of connecting the dots. That is the key visuals. Um, I can show you the website later on. And uh, the whole idea is about, well, a quote from Steve Jobs a long time ago. This is the quote. Um, once he said that in the Stanford like, graduation uh, speech, he mentioned about you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in the future. You have to trust in something, your gut's destiny, life, karma, whatever. Well, uh, connecting the dots is also like a, um, is, is a little game that we play when we were young. In Chinese, it's lian lian kai. Um, it's fun, you know, uh, before you know what's going on, you saw the numbers and then it's simply just connect the numbers, then you see a fish or a car or something. Somehow I think it's just like what we are doing. You know, every time when I create projects uh, related to art and technology and science, people start asking a lot of questions. But until you met them up, they start knowing what's going on. How does that topic or all these artwork or creation relates to their daily life or our society. And then that's why I think of this, you know, uh, rationale to do a media art development archive for Hong Kong media arts developments. So we have connecting the dots. As I mentioned, connecting the dots got two parts. The first part is a web magazines, which um, this is the key visuals, the website visuals. Uh, we have different parts. For example, I interviewed Ellen Pao and Danny Yong Bova, uh, like start working on art and technology since 80s in Hong Kong. And then also a lot of artists, curators, researchers, including Linda Lai, um, uh, uh, Kyle as well, you know, different generation. And also artists from different generation working with different medium, including, you know, internet, video, interactive design, et cetera. And then by these interviews, I write and also we edit into videos to put it up on the websites so that people can, you know, know more about what's going on all these years from the very beginning to the recent years. And then also the second part is about interviews. No, no, the second part is about um, the online exhibitions. <clears throat> I invite around like 12 artworks, but it's already closed the, the exhibition parts. It includes video arts, game arts, um, installation online to offline, and then many different kinds of like projects showcase out there by different generations. Uh, some crucial difficulties for that is um, some work, for example, like CD-ROM arts. I don't know, you know the age group of the people here, <laughs> but then maybe a lot of people didn't hear about CD-ROM arts before. Even myself, when I start working uh, since around like early 2000s, uh, a very limited chance that we can encounter CD-ROM arts work. And then this is one of the examples that I would like to talk more about today, which is um, very difficult to archive the work because the media itself is already fade out. And then what we could do uh, by that time is actually I seek advice from different programmers and also the artist groups to discuss how to mimic the experience of CD or arts on websites. Uh, we did that eventually. And then, and then by that time, I still have a very strong question in my mind. This mimic experience is not exactly the artwork for sure because the medium changed, but we are trying to you know, mimic the form of it 
And then eventually, um, I, I, I find an online video, like uh, several weeks ago, related to how, how curators preserve um, Nam Jun Peck's um, electronic superhighway in the museums. And then from that video, actually, I learned a lot as well. Uh, sometimes uh, we have to look into the artwork that to see if that work is, um, what is the essence or exactly the content or the form that we would like to preserve. And then as a curator and researcher, we have to understand the medium itself and also the context of the work and then see uh, which way is the best way that we can archive it. Of course, we can do video documentation, photo documentation and write up. But at the same time, if there is any way new technology can help, we will incorporate that into it too. So that's the experience. And then um, after I finished connecting the dot, uh, project online, uh, and then I realized that, well, that's only a starting point. In my mind, I should have like two to three more projects as a whole to integrate the whole thing. It's like a brief timeline only. Uh, so I collaborate with um, Hong Kong Asia Art Archive to provide a write-up. Uh, this is the, the screen capture. Oh, I got the QR code here, just in case you want to you know, scan and take a look of the article. And then in Asia Art Archive, I write an article about the listing. Also, I kind of propose a, kind of a list of readings and books and uh, journals that they can acquire to provide more perspective about the concept media archaeology and media arts development in Hong Kong. So uh, that's a quick sharing about what I've done last year, focusing on this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, for your kind sharing. Um, next up, uh, let's welcome uh, Carl to share. Uh -huh. Let me share my screen. Yes. Okay. You see, okay. Great. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I would love how, how I would love to be with, you know, the ICA community over there in Barcelona, but um, unfortunately we can't fly anywhere to still in, in Hong Kong. Um, so, Siri, so in any case, very happy to be here. I'm gonna try and keep it short. I wanna give you um, a brief background of the uh, Leave Your Body Virtual Ghetto Depot Residency on Minecraft. In a nutshell, this is a, um, a virtual environment uh, hosted by um, Videotouch, a media art organization in Hong Kong that is kind of like an alternative um, site, an alternative virtual site um, that we use as a uh, virtual platform for uh, experimental curatorial practice. And very brief background, like March 2020, I'm not going to really go into detail about this, but I think the background is quite important for this project. Um, as most of you will be familiar, March 2020, most or part of the world went into lockdown. A lot of these um, major art and cultural institutions um, provided, like there was like a flux of online content uh, uh, kind of made accessible to, to the public when people are, you know, on lockdown, stay at home, like this, uh, it's, it's, it's a great thing um, the, in terms of the access to the stuff. But at the time I was thinking the engagement model was a bit um, 1990s, that I thought just because you put stuff online, that's not the most engaging, um, uh, method in terms of um, making the online content accessible. So June 2020, um, I was invited to, um, Video Touch invited me to do an um, online program, um, but the, the rebel me thinking, I'm not going to do what, <laughs> what I just had my simple critique on uh, the major institutions. Then I thought of this idea of um, using a game to engage artists to um, do something creative. Um, and at the time, some of you may recall, Animal Crossing was a huge hit um, in, in, in the gaming community. And 
um, I did a little play research. It's quite extensive play research, realizing actually um, the Animal Crossing wasn't the most um, uh, like it doesn't offer the most freedom for like our creative traditionists to do something remotely creative. It takes like at least two weeks for someone to actually get familiar with the with the with the system. Even though um, quite a lot of uh, museums um, have adopted this game for their online program. So I went back to my roots. And when uh, going back to when, I think 10, 12, 14 years ago, when Minecraft first came out, I was a huge fan, th uh, realizing that Minecraft is a virtual world, virtual environment, uh, providing the interface, easy, um, like easy to access interface, easy to pick up a short learning curve for um, the players to actually essentially create um, anything they want with the toolbox, especially in the creative mode. And then through some baseline research, um, there were, there's been uh, precedents but uh, using Minecraft for uh, uh, art programming. Uh, this Liverpool Biennial 2016 was uh, the project that I think commissioned two artworks in um, on Minecraft. This is a good uh, reference, I would say, um, in both in terms of like it's a good precedence, but also it's a uh, on the other hand a good reference kind of that sets what I'm uh, going to tell you apart. Uh, like instead of like what. Um, it's been done for Liverpool by a new commissioning artists to create artworks on Minecraft. I wanted to actually uh, build a site for the artists to respond to, especially we were, I was talking about lockdown, like people were like kind of stuck at home. I wanted to give them the, um, at least the, a level of the sense of the site uh, for the audience. So I ended up um, working with the Minecraft architect that we've been working on. This Minecraft platform in, since the first edition, Leo, recreated a virtual Keto Depot, which is where um, Video Touch is based, um, and, and also a uh, Keto Depot as a cultural heritage site uh, in Hong Kong, now occupied by uh, many art organizations. So we have the site at this point, and it's only a site, it doesn't make the program. Um, and then at the time, I, I was really uh, curious about Exquisite Corpse, this um, art making format. Um, and for those who are not familiar with Exquisite Corpse, it, it's like essentially with this painting as an example, three artists came together, uh, putting something onto the canvas, responding to what's been done previously by, by the previous artists. I wanted to do that on Minecraft. So um, I invited four um, art practitioners, artist curators in Hong Kong from all, all walks of life, um, like kind of, for example, Peter Nelson as a media artist, Maging Tung Tu with uh, a, a less technical, I wouldn't call her media artist, a contemporary artist, but with a social media presence. And for example, uh, Frank King, who's a uh, who's got who's an iconic uh, contemporary artist in Hong Kong, and also who has a uh, for decades his studio on the uh, Tech Kettle Depot or the physical Kettle Depot artist village. So I put I invited four artists um, doing um, exquisite cops on Minecraft, kind of back to back um, week long residency. And with um, each artist in kind of uh, each participants responding to the site itself and also responding to what's been done by previous artists. And um, I won't go into detail of each artwork, but just as an example, Peter Nelson put um, is like the entire virtual site of Keto Depot into this glass vitrine. Um, putting the, the imagine the manual labor of putting the glass blocks um, around and over Keto Depot. So through this exercise of res the week-long residency by different artists, um, different they, they respond to each other, uh, actually accomplishing, I would say, 
what I hope is the 21st century version of uh, Exquisite Cops. Um, as part of dissemination, uh, after the week-long residency, I um, did a play dates with each participant and engaging them talk, to talk about their experience throughout their uh, virtual residency and also talk about what they've done um, throughout. Uh, we had a blast and, and we ended up um, having YouTube clips um, just uh, like kind of even though it's like a half an hour play thing we put it together like about three to five minutes uh, by our, our lovely video touch team um, and it was it was so much fun and and with mugging tong as an example I would say she didn't really actually do much within her week-long residency but um, part of the deliverables of the entire residency, I would say, is the play date itself. And it was just so much fun um, talking to her about her experience. Um, and the video itself, I would say, is a major deliverable. So that was the first edition. And like I said, Leave Your Body is a, um, an experimental curatorial platform uh, for um, experiments. So we've done six editions since then. And for each edition, we try to use a different format. Like the first edition, we use exquisite corpse. And as we move further into um, the different editions, um, like this one, um, we presented the virtual sites in an, art, in an art fair in Hong Kong in VR. For the second edition, we um, invited, oh, in collaboration with Video Club in Brighton uh, in the UK, instead of exquisite of this week-long residency, we um, put two artists together, uh, Andrea Su and Cliff Assage, occupying the virtual site for a month at the same time, um, so that they will have actually a chance to, instead of responding to each other in the format of exquisite cops, they respond to each other, like they, they come across each other on the same sites. Um, Taipei Contemporary Art Center for the third edition. And we invited back a um, Peter Nelson um, for the fourth edition. At the time, Peter Nelson had a solo exhibition at the physical sites in um, our uh, video touches uh, exhibition space, showcasing these um, machine learning generated um, trees, air quotes. Um, and uh, as kind of on the side, we also invited him to um, put these machine learning generated trees, as opposed to, you know, the physical exhibition, trees in prints or paintings. Um, we wanted the trees in as the 3D model to be put in this virtual site in, in, in the Minecraft version as well. And the fifth edition in collaboration with British Council um, in Hong Kong, uh, we invited Gary Woodley to make a site-specific uh, installation, essentially expanding the sites beyond Kettle Depot and moving on to 13 streets, um, a low-income um, residential area in, in Hong Kong, um, just opposing the, another lower-income um, uh, site in North London, um, kind of connecting the two sites with his uh, site-specific installation. And the sixth edition, very recently, um, and for another collaboration with uh, Video Club in Brighton, um, in a similar format as uh, what we've done with Clifford Such and Angela Sue. I'm not going to go into detail. I think I'm overrun. Like for a couple of minutes, minutes uh, we can talk more about it in our conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tao. Thank you so much for sharing. And Yes, lastly, but not least, let's welcome uh, Suwai to kindly share with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Good, you can see me now, right? Okay, then. thank you. Thank you, uh, John and Mira for organizing this. And also thank you, Video Touch for you know, inviting me to, to be part of this uh, panel. Um, my name is Su Wei. Actually, I'm 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 a curator and a art history researcher based in uh, Beijing. So, uh, a little bit a little bit about my uh, my uh, background. Actually, um, 
I and my, my work in recent years somehow uh, focuses on you know reconstructing and the narrative of contemporary Chinese art history and uh, explores uh, the roots of the legitimacy and the rupture of contemporary Chinese art uh, in a global context. So pivotal to my work is that the uh, uh, the attempt to take the post nineteen forty nine. Uh, as the key in understanding artistic production in a contemporary situation. And in so doing, I somehow seek to uh, redefine the stance and possibilities of art in nowadays China. So I engage in a, in a, in a somehow uh, anti-establishment critical practice by um, mapping the limits, uh, contextual clues and unconsciousness, unconscious energies of the post-1949 art production. So a bit, a, a little bit about my background because it's also related to what I'm going to introduce uh, in my in my, in my talk. So I, I I actually wrote down what I'm going to say. So I just I will just read it out. So beginning in 2000, 2016, I was commissioned by Video Touch to curate a long term archival project, you know, in order to expand the archival collection of video art in of, of about mainland China. So the genesis of this project was the exhibition, uh, uh, no references, a revisit of video and new media art history in Hong Kong since 1986, that I co-curated uh, together with uh, Phoebe Wong, uh, the chairman of Video Touch. So this exhibition is a retrospective that builds on the history of Video Touch as an institution and re-examines the birth and development of new media art, including video, uh, in, in in Hong Kong. So new media new media art is a field of seminal importance in the contemporary art uh, landscape of Hong Kong, and a major factor that ha that has situated local contemporary art in Hong Kong within the globalized contemporary art world. So this exhibition took place in 2016 at a time when the political situation in Hong Kong was undergoing a dramatic transformation. At the moment, everything that Hong Kong suffered or was suffering was in fact linked or can be linked to the history of this particular modern society, the history of this political subjectivity. Therefore, as an outsider, I could, I'm from Beijing, I'm from mainland China, as an outsider being in Hong Kong at that time, I, was, I also wanted to somehow find the formation of the subjectivity, subjectivity of, of Hong Kong contemporary uh, art from the pers uh, of Hong Kong actually from the perspective of art. So review reviewing the history of Hong Kong art itself, especially analyzing the dynamics of Hong Kong contemporary art, the self awareness formed in its history and the dilemmas it faces and so on became the core issue of, of this uh, ex exhibition. So I'm very thankful at that time, you know, to to video touch and especially to Alan Powell, Phoebe, John, you know, for the for their tremendous trust and support on this research-based research exhibition. We also used a lot of material from the VMAC archive. VMAC is actually a hard disk that somehow contains, you know, uh, like th more than thousands of video works files uh, from many regions of the world. So actually, uh, when, I, when, I, when I opened that hard drive for the first time, uh, that, that the afternoon was truly unforgettable because through these digital files, I was able to re-enter. Uh, I was able to re actually re-enter re a period of history that was about to be obliterated. So, to be honest, the part of this archival collection that was about Hong Kong actually contained many artists, many works of artists uh, that are not very well known today. So, many of them also worked uh, in a low-profile way. So, especially in a place like you know, Hong Kong uh, with a strong art commercial uh, climate and expensive studio rents. So their experimental pioneering works did not receive the attention it deserved. So it is precisely this part of the archive, you know, the spirit of, of self-organization of, you know, this undergroundness and avant-garde appeals to me. I mean, you know, global, globalization or now these factors are the most fundamental and principled things in contemporary art. So through this exhibition, no references, I was introduced to Video Touch's archival collection project. So, so the following year, 
uh, Phoebe uh, reached out to me, uh, you know, about curating a collection for Remac on video art in mainland China. So I, I was very happy to uh, accept this commission. For me personally, it was also a very big challenge, actually. So how, because I I, I was I have been thinking I could, I have been thinking actually how do you curate you know such a collection for an institution that exists outside of mainland China, and how do you establish the criteria? For selecting works, so what kind of a mes uh, message does the collection need to send to the art world, or even, I mean, on a very uh, institutional level, how to complete, you know, the formalities and the contracts for the collection, which is, after all, you know, a completely different place for two, uh, two social uh, social systems. In the uh, 1980s, video art emerged as a new medium mainland China and played an important role in the radical underground and experimentalist atmosphere of the 1990s. On the one hand, video art in mainland China has been strongly marked by conceptual experimentation from the beginning, influenced by post-1970s video art in Europe and the United States, while at the same time inheriting to some extent a series of unfinished practices that began in the Chinese art world after the, the so-called 85 new wave. Many artists who pick up video equipment for the first time attempted to explore it in a way uh, that was devoid of meaning and personality. This is what is commonly understood as video art in China. So in fact, this de-meaningful, depersonalized approach was not unique to video art in mainland China, but, uh, but was directly related to many of the discussions that were taking place within the Chinese art world at that time. So this included reflections on the 85 new wave, an art movement that mixed modern, contemporary, grand narrative, decontextualization, de and many other contradictory elements. So they also included some of the issues that had been the focus of, the, of, of attention within the, art, uh, within the art academies in mainland China, but had been, these issues had been, or this discussion had been controversial due to the rise of the new art in the, in the 1980s, such as what is the form of art, what is the unique language of art, and what is the relationship between the artist, the artist and the artistic uh, expression. It was in this context, for example, that Zhang Peili's earliest video artworks, with which we are very familiar actually, were born. Zhang uh, himself, he was an, also an important participant in the 95 new wave. In his work, Hygiene Number no. Three, he uses a camera to record the process, the process of repeatedly scrubbing a rooster with his hands. In fact, we can even consider this work as a case of conceptual art. And by selecting an everyday object, the rooster, and repeatedly scrubbing it, the artist shatters the everyday everydayness of the scene and conveys a kind of a break and a contradict with everyday reality. On the other hand, uh, there's also a group of artists who are influenced by the language of the camera in pioneering cinema and who remain attentive to the often obscured, absurdly complex social reality of China. They pick up the camera and create on the level of documenting and reflecting on the social conditions of China. So I, I would call this the second path of the Chinese video art. This path is clearly different from the conceptual video creation that artists like Dan Peli uh, engage in, and it is commonly called moving images. The artist Zhao Liang, for example, born 1969, sorry, uh, is an artist as well as a film director. In many of his works, it is difficult to distinguish the line you know, between video and moving images. One example is the work for youth, you can see here, a short work that recalls a topless youth breaking into a Huchun area to be demolished maintain his anger with bricks. The camera language is both documentary and pioneering because although this pioneering nature does not seem to be entirely self-conscious, this work shows the pre prevalence of violence in Chinese society, whether from the government or from individuals. But this documentary nature is also constituted by the shaky camera, the slightly uncanny colors of the nice shots and the conceptual language that lacks narrative. So I don't so I think it is not very necessary to distinguish between video and moving images in mainland China for two reasons. Firstly, because the new psychological impact 
and the new creative motivation brought by the new medium video has a time limit. And this time limit is about 15 years. So the anxiety of the medium was quickly replaced by the anxiety of the art industry around uh, 2005, because a clear, before a clear uh, distinction could be made between what is video and what is moving images in the contemporary art world in China. The second reason is that the Chinese artists of the 1990s who worked with video cameras, whether conceptual or documentary, were exploring the potential of this new media in response to some essential issues of art production itself, such as the relationship between art, art, art and reality, which is addressed in both conceptual video and documentary works. Or uh, they also deal with social problems, such as the gen a general lack of support for artistic infra infrastructure, picking up a, a cinema, uh, sorry, picking up, picking up a, a camera. It's kind of a way of self-organization at the time during the 1990s. So that means both video art and movie, moving images have to deal with the same issues, whether it is art issue or social issues that is related to art. So and this is often over, overlooked. So these two passes of video practice from the premise of our review of video art in mainland China. So uh, I try to open up the narrow definition of video art and place it in the recent history of Chinese con contemporary art to broaden its boundaries. So this archive or collection project uh, focuses on the evolution of these two paths. On the one hand, we look at the new perspectives and approaches that video as a new medium has injected into art practice in mainland China. At the same time, we also included the work of new generation of artists from the last decade in, in whose video works, media anxiety is gradually evolving into a more multi-dimensional exploration. So the dialogue between the works of the old and new generations of Chinese artists becomes uh, the most noteworthy part of this collection. Especially for the new generation of artists, it is becoming an increasingly pressing issue of recognize their own position to describe the urgency that arises from the creation process, process itself and to bring, to bring up in a self-reflectively fashion the issue of reality where artistic creation is concerned in a more homogenized global art world and an increasingly nihilistic Chinese art industry. So then about uh, the new generation of artists, I think it's very hard to completely sort out a clear path uh, because diversity is indeed a primary primary uh, character characteristic, but I think there are also you know still there are also some clues that can be presented for discussion. For example, in art artist Li Ran's works, born 1986, he often plays himself as a character, such as a voiceover artist, a host, a patient, and so on, and intimates these characters in his work beyond ge uh, geography. He plays the role of a wilderness adventure host, such as you know this uh, famous uh, uh, Discovery Channel, completing uh, an adventure program and a fake set that is intentionally set up so that people can recognize it. His mouth is the kind of seductive narration that hosts need to say to lead viewers to lead us layer by layer into the unknown, just as adventure programs. Uh, tend to make up a, a story and makes viewers think the story is true. He also encounters a group of local primitive men and interacted with them. So the entire work is metaphorical and we can see, uh, we can see in an, his uh, division of performan uh, performativity in the art industry and the awkwardness of a certain domin dominant discourse when it encounters the other. This is actually the, uh, the, the exhibition video of this uh, video installation. Another work uh, is the art from the artist uh, Li Liao, born also 90, uh, 1984. His work, Single Bed Number Two, Playground. In a downtown area in Shenzhen, a southern, southern city that is uh, connected to Hong Kong, Li Liao cleaned out a single bed area of the ground and slept on it until he woke up naturally or ended up with an unexpected interruption. The performance was done four times uh, at the intersection of Guanggu Pedestrian Street, inside an ATM room in a bank, 
at a lake and in a neighborhood playground. This performance work does not use the video medium as the main uh, fulcrum, but discusses the boundaries of public space in mainland China and people's perceptions of it. However, uh, performativity itself becomes an implicit issue of the work as the artist seem to remind the audience that my performance is just a performance and it will not have much impact on this absurd public space. So I think that's all I can say because you know, 2000, 2020 and 2022 is a period when mainland China is the shadow, in the shadow of the pandemic and those crises in the art world in China that emerged a decade ago are more clearly exposed during this during these two uh, two or three years. Mainland China seems to have been uh, slowly ex excluded from the global contemporary art scene. What is a new urgency requires us also to make a timely reflection, starting from the internal pro pro problems of art, to find a way out of today's uh, predicament. Thank you. All. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for all the presenters' inspiring and informative sharings. So because our time is almost up, um, do any one of you have any questions about the presentation, please feel free to put in the chat box or let us know. Yeah. Please put it in the questions and answer area if you're online. And do we have any quick questions from the audience? For our remote participants from Asia, I have a question back here. Yes, we have two questions for Kyle. Thanks, Hinda. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, um, I have a question for Su Wai. <clears throat> um, I recognize some of the images that you showed because they are also in the Isaiah Archives. About uh, 10 years ago, we had a proposal to uh, hold Isaiah in, uh, in China. And um, the, the bits did not make it because there were some competing bits that were maybe better. But also, the, the Isaiah board has a problem, had a problem is the fact that. Uh, it seems any improvisation would not be possible, or like last minute changes in the program and things like that. Uh, and maybe you have no opinion about this, but I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think of the possibility to hold an idea in China? To hold what? Sorry, the last sentence. Uh, this is the International Symposium on Electronic Art, where you are presenting today. And my question was, do you, do you are aware of the uh, ICS symposium, right? Sorry, I, I can't hear you very clearly. Can you re uh, repeat it for me? Because it is it's a bit far away from the, uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, this is much better. Yes, thank you. Sorry, maybe this is more understandable. Um, my question was, there was a, a, a bit to hold uh, 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 the symposium, this symposium, the International Symposium on Electronic Art, to hold it in uh, China. We had that bit about 10 years ago. And it yeah. was not accepted because we felt there was no uh, room for improvisation and last minute changes. Mm -hmm. And those are typical for ICM things change until the last moment. Um, mm. My question was, and maybe you're not able or willing to, to uh, have an opinion about this, but what do you think are the chances to hold an idea in, uh, in China these days? I mean, I, I mean I, it's definitely possible. I mean, there's still, I know the censorship is, is very strict and I, I, I know the public space is getting absurd now. But still, I mean, there's still you know gaps between the between what the uh, authorities uh, require and what and, and the contemporary art world. I think there's okay. still many many uh, possibility to do to do that. That's you right. only have to find a, a, a yeah a institution for for it. Not okay. not official ones, but but private museums or or in the, uh, or alternative spaces. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, that's a very uh, good answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. <laughs>
Well, let's hope in the future there will be uh, changes. <laughs> Um, if we still have time, there, there are also two questions in the chat box uh, directing to Kyle. Uh, do we still have time for this? Uh, Kyle, Kyle, can you, can you skip? Very quick responses because we have another session directly uh, after. Thank Kyle, you. Can, you. Can you see the questions? If not, I can read it, for, read it out for you. Uh, you have muted your mic. You have muted. You're, you're muted. Go ahead and read out the question and answer it. In, in your experience with Minecraft as a platform for collaboration, did you feel constrained by its features? Would you prefer having a similar environment developed? Blah 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 blah. Right. Um, one of the um, one of the one of the really interesting things that came up um, in the play dates when I was talking about the play dates after the week long residency with the participants was that um, the artists appreciated the sites to respond to, like the virtual sites Keto Depot, a uh, virtual Keto Depot, um, mainly because of the constraints. Like if it's just completely just starting from just a uh, void, the artist wouldn't know what to do. Uh, that especially actually Mugging Tone uh, mentioned that. And um, as a base for inspiration, I would say the virtual site itself is quite important. Um, that's one of the main thing. Um, but when I found out the uh, Liverpool Bio New 2016, when they commissioned two artworks, that's the one that is just, I think that's the premise for the artists commissioning two artworks on Minecraft and they build whatever they want. Um, that wasn't the, I wanted to set the program apart from that. And at the same time, I think because of the sites, because of the virtual sites being um, virtual Keto Depot, like that's that materiality of the site carried forward or kind of in connection to the physical sites and the uh, uh, virtual sites hosted by uh, Videotouch. I think it's quite important for um, to have that site as a um, as a as inspiration for artists to respond to. Um, so, so I think that sense of constraints is a healthy relationship. Um, in, in only in this case, only in this case. Um, do it, should I also do we have time for the second question? Um, or maybe very quickly. Um, materiality, materiality of media arts, especially in archiving. I think, in a nutshell, for the Leave Your Body platform, like I said many, many times, it's, an, um, it's for experiments, it's for curatorial experiments. And it, um, it, it by design raises more questions than providing answers in that, in that sense. So, um, and, and the kind of questions that may be relevant to your question, um, kind of derived from Leave Your Body, I would say would be kind of the materiality in Leave Your Body exists on many levels. Like I can't isolate any um, individual artworks contributed by the artists. Like I said, the artworks res like were created responding to the site itself. Like when I am to archive these individual artworks, I will have to archive the entire site. But the, on another level, the artworks are by individual artists that they deserve their own identity. This is the kind of, you know, uh, kind of, when I said like it raises, if your body raises more questions than providing answers. Um, and and um, to end on the note, I suppose this um, in our business, like asking the right questions is very important. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid time is up. Um, thank you very much. It was a very useful and uh, informative panel. And um, see you next time live, I hope, again. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. See, you. Thank you. see you guys soon, I hope. Thank you. Yeah, it's so great. I'm going to put this box that uh, Jill Scott made this at home. She clearly did nursery school. Uh, Dave, you're uh, required to uh, comment on uh, on Isaiah in general and this. Terrific, uh, yes. if, I, if you have any ideas, it's okay, the request is written on this yellow paper that you all have.
Put them in the shoe box, this is a real drop box. And how long is the break? Tell me. Five minutes. Five minutes break. <laughs> <laughs>